looks like here we are right at 12 noon on Wednesday. It's time for another Kukarinkin Lunch and Learn. And today we're very excited to be presenting the new Pix4D Vidoc hand scanning system with Brady Rice. Now, Brady has been part of the uh, Pix4D beta testing team with the uh, Vidoc in addition to being a, a regular user. So I think we're going to hear some exciting and, and uh, certainly some very fun information through the the presentation here. So Brady, without any further comment, I'm just going to turn it straight over to you, sir. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Douglas. And thank you everybody for joining us today. Uh, really excited to have you here and to talk about the Vidoc system. Uh, so let's go ahead and just jump straight into it. And uh, so today uh, you, you are here to uh, look at the pix 4 Vidoc system. This is an introduction. Uh, we'll be going over some basics and um, some more uh, intermediate uh, information. However, this is not an advanced this, uh, class. This is just informational for you um, to absorb. So as Douglas has mentioned, um, I've been on the beta team for the Vidoc system for uh, quite some time now. Um, so a little bit about me before we jump into the Vidoc itself. Uh, my name is Brady Reich. I am the virtual design and construction reality capture specialist here at Kuka Rankin. Uh, I am a 107 certified uh, UAS operator. I've been uh, a lot of enterprise support back in the day, a lot of my background. I am still an instructor with Sundance Media Group and a PIX40 uh, specific instructor as well. So we are actually certified by PIX40 to teach you PIX40. Uh, we're not a third, uh, third party company who says we can teach it. Uh, we're actually certified from PIX40. Anyways, what I'd like to uh, have you look at here for just a moment is I have a little QR code down on the very bottom. If you have any questions, you can scan this code and it will give you my contact information. Uh, if you have additional uh, questions moving forward after this webinar, you certainly let us know and uh, we can move forward and get you the information you need. So to the Vidoc itself, what is the Vidoc? The Vidoc system is a very high precision tool for digital twinning. So you hear digital twinning a lot, that just means we're creating a digital model of something. Uh, what this specifically does with the Vidoc is we are adding RTK precision to your mobile device. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a moment. Uh, so this allows you to digitize your project and have it for accurate measurements, documentation, uh, as built. There's uh, quite a long list uh, lengthy list of different things that you can use the system for. So some of the features of the Vidoc system is that it is high precision for accurate measurements uh, because we're pulling in multiple different constellations to get more data rather than just using GPS on the phone. We'll get into that in just a moment. Uh, we're able to capture static control point locations. So those of you who utilize uh, aerial drones and you'd like to start using ground control points, you can use this system actually to grab a specific point or that control so you know the exact location of that, uh, the center of the target. Uh, this has a standalone battery pack. Uh, this is huge. Uh, any of you who, likely most of you are using some sort of an iPhone, uh, you use up your phone very, very quickly and if it overheats, um, it shuts off. So we're able to remove the need to power this device from your phone by using an internal battery. Uh, it's also easy to install and remove off of the case. Um, I'll show you that in just a moment. And then it's also extremely easy to utilize the interface using the PIX40 catch, which we'll talk about in just a few moments as well. So what I would like to show you um, is the case itself that we're gonna be using. We'll talk about what's compatible here. But this case is very important because this case is the SP Connect uh, from Spigen. This is a third party case. However, the, the way that it, it uh, connects, we have two little slots up on the top and on the bottom. And if we look on the back of the Vidoc system, we have these two little uh, bars. So this system simply goes on sideways. You push it in, make sure it's fully seated. And then we turn to lock it into place. Now, this case and the phone are connected. Um, in order to remove it, we do the exact opposite. We just turn it to the side and then we peel away and there it is. So very simple to utilize. There's no um, hardware connection um, aside from the case. So there's no cables, there's no anything else. This is a Bluetooth protocol from the uh, Vidoc to your mobile device. 
So where can we utilize the system? Well, this system, as I alluded to a little bit earlier, is for as-built digital twinning. We want to make a copy of what's currently there. Um, of utility trenches is a really big use case currently because if you have uh, an, an issue, maybe there is a leak of a pipe. Well, the person who installed it or the company that installed it can actually take this information and make a digital, digital twin to show that it was fine as the piping went in, maybe it was the guys who came to uh, drop in the aggregate or uh, put the concrete or the asphalt over the top of that. So it, it's a good way to cover yourself and your company to ensure that everything was done appropriately and to uh, specifications. This shows uh, current conditions of anything. Um, you're utilizing uh, several different sensors from the phone. Uh, you're using photogrammetry and LIDAR and depth point clouds to pull up this information. Um, so you can use conditions of anything or maybe even augment something where you're flying a drone over the top, but you need to get a little more detail because the drone is flying one to two to, to 400 feet above the ground. We're not getting really good resolution. So we can actually add more resolution and more detail in those needed areas using your phone with the Vidoc system. Um, asset verification to ensure that something was done correctly. Um, if you're a city municipality and you want to verify that the trenches were done appropriately, you can come back and do a validation and keep records of where all the pipes are. Because later, as they may need to dig out the pipe or service the pipe for some reason, they now have an as-built or that information to see what was there during the scan. Construction progress, um, as I mentioned, digital twinning, uh, volumetric calculations, uh, anything that's going to be fairly close, uh, you can do a calculation just by simply walking around with your cell phone. And many, 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 many more. There are so many different use cases. We can't go over every single one with you. So I'll leave it up to your imagination. And if you think you can do it, we can probably do it. Get in touch with me and we'll figure it out with you. So how do we use the Vidoc and, and how, do, how does the interface work? So we'll talk a little bit about catch in just a moment, but I'm going to play this video here. And, and I apologize, this is vertical video instead of horizontal video. Uh, however, we're just scanning it with the phone. Uh, we have the Vidoc installed on the back of the phone. You'll see on the top left corner, there's 28 next to the satellite symbol. So we've got 28 different satellites we are utilizing meaning that we're not just using GPS, we're not just using Galileo or GLONASS, we're using uh, as much GNSS uh, constellations as possible here. So we've got a really good signal. Uh, you see that we have an HTOP or, or basically our, um, our potential error um, is very low and we have RTK, which is fixed. So it gives us a horizontal and a vertical deviation in feet. Um, so we're getting really good results. And as we're moving around, you'll see we're filling in these tiles. You'll see some of those tiles didn't fill in. Uh, that's simply because my phone was overheating. We did gather that information, uh, but it just didn't show it with the user interface. Um, and as we start walking around some of these other uh, bushes, we're getting more and more information. Now, on this day, as I'm going to replay about halfway through here, uh, you'll see on a lot of the palm trees that there's a lot of movement, things that are moving around. This will affect our data. Now, there are ways to go through to resolve this. Uh, after we go through the pulse process, we can remove certain uh, uh, movements or certain areas to clean up that data. Uh, however, in this case, that wasn't really the focus for the plants um, or the vegetation. We're mostly looking at the, the concrete and, and the um, asphalt and how it's kind of built up. So then what do we do once we have all the information on our phone? Well, we use the uh, Pix4D Vidoc system, uh, like, again, with that special uh, case with our phone right on the inside here. And the Pix4D catch uh, gathers all that information and we store it locally on our phone. Then from there, we can do a couple different things. We can upload it directly to the cloud. So you have to make sure you've got cellular service or a wireless signal to upload the data to the cloud. Once it's on the cloud, it starts processing by itself. This is a great way for a lot of people who don't want to go into depth and adjust and make little tweaks here and there uh, for their data. So it's very simple, upload it, let it go. Then it's gonna be online for you to share it or to be able to do volumetrics or calculations and look at it that way. But again, this is the hands-off. 
So while it's uploading the cloud, personally, what I like to do is actually download the information from the mobile device to my laptop or to the computer. And then we process in pix 40 matic uh, and, and again, we'll go over the software here in just a moment on what, what each of these things mean. Uh, but we process the information where I have more control over my data and look at it to make adjustments, uh, remove things. Uh, if we want to adjust, say, those trees that we're moving around quite a bit, we can do a little bit of adjustment within the programming to get rid of some of that to clean up the data, uh, which means that we'll have a cleaner point cloud than if we were to just upload it to cloud and leave it as hands off. So from pix 40 Matic, then we'll typically go through and push it through to pix 40 Survey. pix 40 Survey allows us to do volumetric calculations, uh, line work, we can do planes, um, and then we extract that information from survey into a BIM program. Um, or if you'd like to, you can re-upload all your process data back to the cloud. Uh, the advantage of using something like pix 40 Cloud is you can share it with anybody. So there will be some links here put in the chat that you'll be able to look at a few different projects that I've done uh, using the pix 40 system ecosystem with the Vidoc attached. So pix 40 Catch, first and foremost. So this is the application on your mobile device. This is an absolutely free program on your phone. Doesn't cost a single thing. So I would highly suggest anybody on this call use pix 40 Catch. It's an amazing application. Uh, pix 40 Catch uses the RGB cameras or the red, green, and blue, basically just what we can visually see. It also uses LiDAR, uh, depending on your mobile device. So as an example, this one is an iPhone 13 Pro. Uh, you will see there are three cameras and uh, there's another little sensor underneath of the, um, the glass. That is actually a LiDAR system. So it's, it's not a high power LiDAR system. We have very limited use of that. And if you uh, reflect back on the video that I showed you, as we tilted the phone up to look further out, there was a limit on how uh, how far out the mesh was starting to build. That's because of the limitation of the physical device itself. So we're limited to uh, roughly about uh, two and a half to three meters uh, from your mobile device. Uh, this also creates a depth point cloud. So we're, we're not only looking at our, the visually what we can see, we're also looking at the LiDAR. We're also understanding what the depth of certain objects are. This helps us build that 3D model very rapidly. Uh, and then uh, again, depends on the type of mobile device that you have. Uh, Android currently does not have LiDAR built in, but you can still use the photogrammetry and the regular cameras. Uh, just be aware you may be limited on those sensors depending on the mobile device that you have. So from pix 40 Catch, uh, like I said, we can go directly up to cloud. We just upload it from your mobile phone or from a, uh, an iPad or a tablet. Uh, the process uh, starts building your point cloud inside of pix 40 Cloud. Uh, you can also look at different timelines. If you have a certain site that you want to go back to every week or every month and do a, a digital twin of that specific of, of that specific area, um, you're looking at a timeline. So you can actually change the time to say, hey, I want to go back to, to January of 2022, or I want to push forward to uh, July of 2023. And you can see what the change is over time. Uh, Pix4D Cloud also allows you to utilize overlay tools. So if you have a, um, say, a, a CAD drawing on uh, a big piece of paper here for an architect, and they want to verify that everything was installed correctly before you start going vertical and start building up your walls, you can actually combine those two together so that you can see the, uh, the PDF or the, the plan behind it and the data on top of it. And you just change the transparency. Pix4D Cloud also gives you the option to use automatic control points or GCP, ground control points. So this allows you to automatically pick up those targets and process it without ever touching it to say, this is a target and giving it the definition. It's looking through the cloud to look for specific patterns in order to build those control points for you. Uh, and this is also a great way to share your data sets. Uh, so again, if you look in the uh, chat, you'll see a few different data sets available. This is all available on Pix4D Cloud. Then we also have pix 40 Matic. Matic utilizes the LiDAR and the RGB images from pix 40 Catch. So you have to take the LiDAR data from your mobile device using the Vidoc, um, and it has to either go to the cloud or it has to go through pix 40 Matic. Many of the different programs out there that do photogrammetry 
uh, will pick up the images that are taken by the phone, but not the LiDAR data. Uh, and that's specifically what we're trying to use here. So uh, it does go through pix 4 dmatic to process that information. You can use known reference coordinate systems. Um, you can also localize to a specific site if you need to. Uh, there are scale and orientation constraints to make sure that everything is to the correct proportions, uh, that something isn't skewed or moved too much. Um, and you can also generate different planes and different meshes, uh, basically that blanket over the point cloud to make it look nice and pretty. Then we go into pix 4 d Survey. pix 4 d Survey allows you to use vectorization tools such as polylines, polygons, circles, lines. Um, again, you can add different types of planes. Uh, so this just allows you to annotate your data on the point cloud. So a lot of annotation tools, you can put uh, markers in there, you can put text on, uh, on your point cloud if you need to. This allows you to do stockpile detection and volumetric reporting. So we can look at a stockpile and see how much aggregate or dirt or rock is there. Uh, this will also do roof and wall detection within pix 4 d Survey. So pix 4 d uh, Matic and pix 4 d Survey are usually uh, sold as a bundle. So certainly let us know if you're curious on some of that information and we can get you more details. So we'll uh, go through a few tips for scanning before we go into a few data sets quickly uh, so we don't run out of time today. Uh, so a few different tips is ensure that you have good lighting. We're using the color values and the images from the mobile device, so we need to have good color. Uh, I'm sorry, good lighting. If we don't have good lighting, then we won't be able to uh, stitch things together very well. It will use the LiDAR by itself, but it's not colorized. It's, it's harder to understand what was scanned. Um, as we're moving around with the system, we want to move horizontally as much as possible. So the way that the system captures the images or the LiDAR uh, scan data is it detects movement of the mobile device. So if we sit and if we twist in one spot, we're not getting good information. We want to move around objects in more of a horizontal pattern or vertical pattern. We need physical movement uh, for the gyroscope to start telling it, hey, I need to take another picture and I need to gather more information. So moving horizontally or vertically uh, as you are yawing from side to side is a much better practice with the Vidoc um, and with uh, traditional scanning anyways. Uh, let's see here. So ensure that we have a lot of geometry in our scene. If we don't have very much geometry, it's hard for the photogrammetry to stitch with the LiDAR to then bring it all together. We need to ensure we're walking fairly slowly. The faster you go, the less information, the less overlap we have. And if you've gone to uh, look at any of our other Lunch and Learn specifically on photogrammetry versus LiDAR, you certainly understand um, or, or you can recall that we need to have that overlap. So the slower we, we move, the smoother we move, the better our data becomes. And get as close as you can to get higher detail information. The further back you are, the less resolution we have, but the more area we can cover. Then we move into those specific areas that we need more detail and get really nice, nice and close to view that. So with that, I'd like to show you two different data sets here before we jump into our questions and close up for the day. So this one specifically is a, uh, this is called the Three Kin Mine in Las Vegas. Uh, this one is a uh, mine that has been decommissioned. Um, now they are working to fill in this pit. Um, this is one of the runoffs. This is where they were able to extract a lot of the, uh, the, uh, the raw ore that they wanted out of the specific mine. Um, and you can see this has been standing vacant for quite some time, which is why there's a lot of graffiti. But this is where I think the system just looks in incredible. So if we move in, we can see, and I apologize, my uh, computer's thinking here. I've got a lot of things running in the background. Uh, with this, a lot of that graffiti, we've got a lot of good detail in this data from a cell phone. It's, it's incredible. If we look at... Uh, the walls here, you'll see there's uh, a couple pipes that we can clearly make out. We can see all this graffiti up and down. Uh, you also see where I had uh, walked and where we had a corrected data as we were processing the uh, this data set. And then towards the center with this tower, uh, we've got incredible amounts of detail. We can see 
uh, that people have come in to uh, build skateboard ramps and things like that. Uh, they've definitely put a lot of time to building this up in this area. Uh, and it, it's just really, really interesting to see. Uh, so I, I love this data set. I, I think it's wonderful. And this is just, again, from a cell phone. So then the next one I wanted to show you here is something a little bit more utility-based, um, is a culvert. So this culvert system here, we went through to process this information within Matic and we created uh, the mesh here so we can take a look at it uh, visually. It looks better through, uh, through the lunch and learn. But if we come in, this was a visual inspection to see where we have some problem areas. We can see that there's uh, water, there is uh, wetness coming through from somewhere. Right, So we can help determine what the best course of action would be to remediate or to resolve this uh, from uh, all this water and everything else coming uh, into this area. So this culvert, I think, was, was a great um, example. And you can see certainly on the, uh, on the roof here on the ceiling, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of issues as well. But this allows someone in the office to go through and visually inspect and see what happened. Um, as someone just takes their, their phone with their Vidap system and all they're doing is just scanning. So an incredible amount of data that we can extract from a cell phone. It, it's, it's just incredible. Uh, from here, we can then export this information directly to Picture4D survey, as I had mentioned before. We go into our survey, we'll open this up as a new project. And from here, we can start creating our lines, um, our annotation, our volumetrics, and look at all this information here. And this, this may take a moment since I've got a couple of things running in the background here, but it goes directly into Pix40 survey within the same uh, Pix40 ecosystem. So while that goes through, um, I guess really I wanted to reach out and just see if there were any additional questions that we can help address for you guys uh, while you still have us um, on, the, on the line here. Uh, feel free to put it in chat um, and we'll see. Douglas, do we have any? Oh, looks like we've got a couple uh, in, we in we Zoom have a chat question, here. First of all, from, we have a question, uh, first of all, from David King that I answered in chat, but the rest of the group might be uh, interested in knowing. And that is, is GNSS required? We have many places where network RTK will not resolve. So it is not required for Pix4D catch. However, we will not have additional precision built in. So the idea of, of the VIDOC system is that we need to have some sort of correctional network being broadcast to this device. Now, beyond just having an entrant network and cellular coverage, you may utilize something like an MLID reach system. They're inexpensive to get into. The MLID reach would be your base and the Pixel 4D VIDOC system would be your rover. So even in uh, and non-cellular areas, uh, you can still pick up that information, but you do need to have some view of the sky in order to pull up the uh, the satellites. Excellent. Another question we had here uh, coming in from Shelby in the box culvert. Did RTK need to be maintained or uh, did you have obstructed satellites? Excellent question, Shelby. And so what happened is as we were walking through, we have a good connection at the beginning of the culvert. And then we walk through, we lose our connection. And at the end of it, we actually got our connection back. So ideally, the best way to do, go about that would be to lay down targets on either side where you will have good connection and you lose it in the middle. However, we're still able to pull up that information and correct it to those ground control points that are in good view. So yes, we did lose our RTK correctional network. However, we gained it back as soon as we exited the culvert and we were able to tie that together with control points. What kind of precision are you anticipating inside that culvert, Brady? So within that culvert, uh, if we're tied to the control, uh, we're looking, we're, we're actually getting sub-centimeter. Um, it depends on, again, how many satellites you have, what type of correctional network you're using, and how many sources you're pulling that information from. Uh, so I think we were at, at point, uh, uh, I want to say 0.4 or 0.5 centimeters uh, for our accuracy within the culvert. Yeah, that's my recommend and my, my recollection as well that we were were pretty dar doggone close. We have another question here from uh, about the battery overheating while scanning. How intense is the processing system on a mobile device? Is there a recommended maximum time limit between scans 
And can you capture a larger scan all at once, or is it better to capture small scans and register in post? Excellent question. And, and this would be something that would depend on the operating environment. Um, as an example, I live here in Las Vegas. It gets extremely hot. I think we're going to hit 116 or 117 this weekend. Um, I don't want to be out in that heat, so I'm not going to take my phone out in that heat. Um, so I usually get hot a lot faster than the mobile device would. Um, as the mobile device is capturing the information, it creates a low resolution or step one, if you're used to pix 4 terminology, um, as a low resolution point cloud, as an in initial. Um, and then as you want to process a densified to get more information, uh, things that we want to do volumetrics from, for example, this would all be done either by the computer um, or by the cloud service. So um, as, as far as capturing large scan areas, um, you can scan a, a large area with several thousand images uh, with a, a single scan if you'd like to, or to build it together. Uh, that's really up to you. Um, in most cases, I will do up to um, about 25 to, to 3,000 images um, in a single project, and then I'll stop it, and then I'll make a second section, another project, and then we'll merge those together. Um, afterwards. I find it's a little bit easier on the processing side to do small chunks and then bring them all into one uh, rather than do it all at once. Now, if I remember correctly, the St. George culvert was one single scan and that was uh, between 60 and 70 yards of, of length. Is that that, that is correct. And I think we were sitting at um, between three to 400 images um, that were imported in order to process that. All right, folks, we're, uh, we're starting to run light on time. So if you've got any questions, this is your last opportunity to ask them before we, we wind down our, our lunch and learn. Uh, we, we, of course, always enjoy your questions because it allows us to inform other people. And I don't see anything coming over, uh, over our Facebook uh, page today, Brady. So it looks like the Facebook folks are, are, are sated with, with information. Uh, while we wait for any last questions that are that are coming up, I want to tell folks that our, our next Lunch and Learn, which is on July 19th, next Wednesday, is surveying with the CS20 and GS18. That is going to be presented by Jeremy Kippen, also out of our Las Vegas store. The Las Vegas guys seem to be pretty darn active here, Brady. Mm -hmm. and, <laughs> That's right. Speaking of Las Vegas and, and Brady, uh, on Wednesday, July 26th, Brady will be presenting a, uh, a very special um Lunch and Learn on LiDAR and photogrammetry combined, uh, which is something that, that a lot of folks have not really dived into or dialed into yet. It has been, we've had LiDAR workflows and photogrammetry workflows, but what if you want to work with the, the uh, photogrammetry images and the LiDAR images and register them together simultaneously? So we're very excited about that. Then uh, that'll move us all the way through to August 9th. And we're very excited to be working with, with uh, GOQ. We are going to be seeing an overview comparison of the uh, GOQ TrueView 345 and uh, 355, or excuse me, um, I'm having a, a tongue cramp there, of the, the 345 and the 535 uh, LiDAR systems available from GOQ. So we're very excited about that one. So between... Uh, between the event on the 26th and August 9th, you'll be able to come away being remarkably informed on LiDAR. Of course, you can always check out our YouTube channel and find some of our previous LiDAR presentations, as well as some of the other uh, photogrammetry and uh, using Leica hardware sessions. Well, Brady, I haven't seen any further questions come through, uh, through either the Facebook channel or through our chat channel here. So I think this is a good point to wind us up. Uh, folks, as always, this will be on our, our YouTube channel on the Kukarinkin webpage with, uh, within the next day or two, so you're welcome to go back and, and review it, and of course, invited to see other lunch and learns. So until next time, be safe out there. Brady, thank you. Excellent job today. Thank you, everybody. Have a great day.